David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. Paul preached that all is lost, save knowing Christ. Little John said he is precious. By leaning on his bosom, so for a moment, may I humbly testify. Did I mention? See no way he may. 
How many sermons can be preached about this Jesus? How many songs can be sung about God's Son? upon me as I struggle alone they say I have nothing but they are so wrong in my heart I'm rejoicing how I wish they could see thank you Lord for your blessing Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Lately I've been looking back Along this winding road To the old familiar markers Of the mercies I have known I know it may sound simple But it's more than a cliché There's no better way to tell you than to say God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night and though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been good Times replay and I can see That I've cried some bitter tears But I felt his arms around me As I faced my greatest fears you see, I've had more gains than losses, and I've known more joy than hurt. As His grace rolled down upon me, undeserved, for God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams, when I go to sleep each night And though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been good For God has been my Father My Savior and my friend his love was my beginning and his love will be my end i could spend forever trying to tell you everything he is but the best way that i can say it is this God's been good in my life. I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard... Amen. Good morning. Good, morning. good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. In typical Free Will Baptist... Uh, Version, we're going to start about five minutes late. We don't want to mess up a good thing. Amen. But we appreciate you being here. Appreciate the Lord. Another opportunity to be in his house. Amen. We appreciate each and every one of you being here. If you're a visitor and you're your first time here, uh, right down the back hallway right there are the bathrooms on the right-hand side. Uh, ladies in a men's restroom, water fountain right in the middle. Uh, we do have a nursery uh, if, you, if you so desire to need one of those. Uh, but amen, I promise you, Brother Noah can out-preach a baby. Amen, amen, and God ain't worth a salt if he ain't can't out preach a baby, amen, and amen, if you don't like the way a baby's shouting and carrying on, you start shouting and carrying on, amen, drown the baby out, and just shout together, it'll be before your while, amen, but again, we appreciate you being here, appreciate the Lord, uh, amen, do remember all those that are still traveling, remember those that are sick, uh, not feeling too good under the weather, continue to remember them in prayer, uh, remember this service today, amen, we pray that somebody would walk the aisle and get saved today, amen, uh, you say, preacher, in a room this size, you don't think everybody's saved? Amen. Jesus had 12 disciples, and one of them wasn't saved. One of them actually betrayed him. Amen. Uh, but I do pray, that, amen, that you've come ready to receive that with the Lord has got for us here this morning. Uh, amen. We're so privileged and so honored to have Brother Noah Emery with us this morning. Uh, what a joy and an honor it is to have him. Uh, I love my dear brother. I appreciate him being here. Uh, we just appreciate the Lord and appreciate each and every one of you. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to have right away in this service. We need a touch from him in a mighty, mighty way. If the Lord show up, we can leave here satisfied to overflowing that he has visited with his people. And amen. If God shows up, he shows out. Amen. 
Amen. I, now, Brother Noah, he'll tell you he ain't got to preach. Amen. If the Holy Ghost takes over this service, so be it. Amen. We'll shout, we'll run, we'll carry on. Uh, but amen, if the Lord sees fit to preach the word, you have an ear to hear and a heart to receive. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. My precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. And God, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity. Lord, to be in your house here this morning. God, we pray that, Lord, that you would have right away in this service. God, we need you this morning. Father, Brother Noah did not bring a revival or a message in his pocket, uh, but, God, you'll add the increase and give us the word. Lord, we'll be careful to thank you for it. Uh, God, we pray that you would visit with us. Uh, God, search every heart. God, search every pew, every family. Uh, God, let everyone that came in one way leave another way. Lord, we thank you for this day again. Bless us and help us, guide us in what you would have us to do. Let every word, let every song, let every testimony, and let every word preach give you glory, magnify, edify you, for you alone are worthy of all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen this morning. Amen. Brother Noah is going to lead our congregation, amen, because the preacher can't sing, and amen, he don't want to run nobody off right away, amen. Just keeping it real, amen. Amen. Appreciate, again, Brother Noah coming, taking the time to see to all of us, amen, to see to this. Uh, you just worship the Lord, amen. That's what we've come to do. It's about Him, not about us, amen. When no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, and no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, a glorious day that will be. And what a day that will be. Oh, yes. When my Jesus I shall see. What a day well, that will be, amen. Look to your left, your right, front, behind you. Wave at somebody, smile at them real big. Just let them know you're glad to see them here this morning, amen. And if they don't wave at you, just keep waving until they do it, amen. 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 <laughs> amen. If I can have a couple ushers, amen, we'll take up tithe and offering, give you an opportunity to give unto the Lord. You give as the Lord have you to this morning. Uh, be a cheerful giver, amen. Be obedient in that. Uh, God can take a little and make a lot out of it, amen. Uh, you be obedient. Let the Lord do his work here this morning, amen. Amen. Brother Ethan, you say a bless over this offering, brother.
appreciate your giving. Amen. We thank you for being here. Uh, amen. We want to do our penny march. Amen. Our penny march is a scholarship fund for our young people here at the church. Uh, if they are a member of this church and they graduate high school and they go on to college to pursue that higher education, amen, we want to be a blessing from this church unto them and give them a scholarship to help them down the road. Uh, amen. You say, well, preacher, that sounds all well and good, but it sounds expensive. School's expensive. Amen. All it takes is a penny, a nickel, a dime, a quarter, a one, a five, a ten, a twenty, a fifty, or a hundred. Amen. If you got it, you give it. If God says give a hundred and you give ninety-nine, it'll be a curse. You just keep it. Uh, but if God tells you to give, you give. If you don't have nothing to give, that's fine too. Uh, but amen. Little is much when God is in it. Let's stand to our feet. We'll sing this is the day the Lord has made. Amen. These little youngsters come and take your money from me and you'll smile about it. Amen. This is Be seated if you can, amen. If you can't, shout for us, amen. Amen. Again, we appreciate you being here. Appreciate the Lord. Appreciate this opportunity of worship. I'm glad you've came this way, amen. But if you've come to see somebody other than the Lord, you are missed this morning. Uh, but if you've come to see him, uh, amen, he said, those who seek me, they will find me. Amen. Knock, and it shall be opened unto thee. I still believe that's the truth this morning, amen. Uh, I read over there in Revelation where the Bible uh, speaks of the Lord knocking at the door. Uh, amen. Some would argue that he's knocking at your heart's door trying to get in. I believe in the last days he's knocking on the church door trying to get back in. Amen. Church should be the one place that we shout, glorify, magnify him. Uh, not because of how things are going financially for you, what kind of car you drive, how the house is, everything seems to be. You worship the Lord because of who he is. Amen. He's worthy this morning. Amen. Of all that we have. Uh, again, we appreciate you being here. Appreciate Brother Noah. Uh, amen. I believe he's got some family, amen, with him here. We appreciate them. We are glad to see them. Uh, we're just so glad and honored, amen, that you're here. Uh, ready to, we, we invite the Lord, amen. I'm glad he's here, amen. Uh, without him, it's impossible, amen, but with him it is, amen. Uh, we appreciate again you, uh, Brother Noah, being here, amen. We're going to turn everything over to him now. Uh, you just mind the Lord, amen. If he sings a song, he sings. If he gets up here and starts preaching, you back this young brother up. Would you help me welcome from Vail, North Carolina, Brother Noah Emery this morning. Times 
country play and I can see that I've cried some bitter tears but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears I've had more gains than losses and I've known more joy than hurt because his grace fell upon me undeserved God's been As I go to sleep each night I've had my share of hard times By my side he's always stood Through it all God's been good God has been my father He's been a savior and a friend His love was my beginning And his love will be my end and I could spend forever trying to tell you everything he's been. The best way I can say it is like this. God's been good in my life. I've been blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. My share of hard times by my side he's always stood through it all God's been good tried to make it on my own every time I tried to stand I'd start to fall and all those lonely roads that I traveled on there was Jesus when the life I built came crashing to the ground when the friends I had were nowhere to be found and I couldn't see it then but I can see it now there was Jesus there was Jesus in the waiting in the searching in the healing in the hurting like a blessing buried in all my broken pieces every minute every moment where I've been where I'm going even when I didn't know it and I couldn't see it there was Jesus on the mountain in the valley there was Jesus in the shadow of the alley there was Jesus in the fire in the flood there was Jesus always in in the healing in the hurting like a blessing buried in all my broken pieces every minute every moment where I've been and where I'm going even when I didn't know it and I couldn't see it there was Jesus For this man who needs amazing kind of grace For forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day There was Jesus, there was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting like a blessing buried in all my broken pieces.
places every minute every moment where I've been and where I'm going even when I didn't know it and I couldn't see it there was Jesus of this old world sometimes I just need a word from heaven that everything's okay I try to walk by faith but sometimes I'm so afraid and I cannot see how God would make a way but then I think He's never failed me, never left me, not one time have I cried out, and my voice he has not heard, never failed me, he won't start today, he will make a way. God's forsaken you. Child, don't lose your faith. He is working while you wait. So just hold on. He will bring you through. He's never failed me. Never left me. Not one time have I cried out. And my voice he has not heard. Never It's weird when a man does that to you, but you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Ruth chapter number one this morning. Ruth chapter number one, it is good to be here. And uh, I'm looking forward to what the Lord has for us this morning. And I uh, wrestled with what to say, but I believe I've got the mind of the Lord this morning. Ruth chapter number one. And uh, we're going to look at half of a verse this morning and uh, share with you something quick and simple on my heart. <clears throat> I promise I'll try my best not to hold you too long. Uh, but I ain't going to promise you. Amen. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm pretty hungry. I'll try my best. <laughs> Ruth chapter number 1, verse number 14. When you got it, say amen. If you don't got it, act like you got it. Look on the screen. Amen. <laughs> Ruth chapter number 1, verse number 14, it says, And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Yes, Lord. That's short. I think we can read that again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And uh, out of that short little phrase this morning, uh, there's two categories of Christians, and you'll find yourself in one of them this morning. Go ahead, preacher. And uh, I pray that something I can say or do uh, will help you and bless you, and uh, that you can take what God's going to say to your heart this morning. Uh, but I want to talk to you for a few moments on uh, the kissing and the cleaving. The kissing and the cleaving. God, as humbly as I know how, I ask that you'd anoint me this morning. God, I can't do what I'm going to do this morning by myself, but I need your grace, I need your help, and I need your mercy. God, I ask that you give me a fresh anointing from heaven this morning. God, if there's somebody in this place lost, God, save their soul. 
God, if there's somebody who slipped away from you and this is their first time back in church in a while, God, bring them back home into the fold. God, if there's somebody struggling with a broken heart this morning, God, put that heart back together. God, if there's somebody tr struggling with anxiety and depression this morning, God, bring peace to their troubled mind. God, do exactly what you only can do. God, we'll be so careful to praise you and give you the glory and the honor for any and everything that is done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We uh, begin to dive here. This is, without a doubt, one of my most favorite books in the entirety uh, of the Word of God. I love the book of Ruth. I, I, I think I love it so much because it's an exact picture of our relationship when Jesus came and he rescued us. And right. you begin to find where Ruth would fall in love with Boaz. And you'd find where he sought her out in spite of everything she came from. Yes. That it, that I love to think about. That's the exact same thing that Jesus did when he found us. He looked at everything that we were and everything that we once were and everything that we could be. But he didn't see us for what we were. He saw us for what we have potential of yes. being. And he chased right. us down. Uh, with a reckless and a pursuing kind of love. Amen. You find that all through the book of Ruth, but you begin to look at this particular passage, and to give you a little backdrop of what we have arrived at in Ruth chapter number one, you've got a man by the name of Elimelech who's got a wife by the name of Naomi. And yes, I know they had some weird names back then. Amen. Uh, but you had a man by the name of Elimelech with a wife by the name of Naomi, and you thought Elimelech was bad. Well, they had babies and named them Malon and Chilion. Imagine going to middle school every day and writing Malon or Chilion on your paper. That's, uh, that's weird. And uh, so you find that they're named Malon and Chilion, and, and they are living in this place called Bethlehem, and this famine strikes. They didn't see the famine coming. And so in the middle of the struggle and the trial, they up and just leave and go to a place called Moab. Now, Moab was not a good place because you look over in the book of Psalms, and God even called Moab his wash pot. He, he, he said it's not a good place to be. It's, it was almost like Sodom and Gomorrah, almost. It was just not a good place for, for a child of God to be dwelling. And they're in this place where, where, where famine has gotten the best of their knowledge. And so they move somewhere they know they're not supposed to be. But because of the current situation, it causes them to do something they never thought that they would do. Because how many of you know that it's easy to shake our, our, our fingers in their face and say, how could you do something that dumb? But a lot of us do stuff in trials, too, without us thinking why because crisis will cause you to do something you wouldn't do in your right mind crisis will cause you to leave people you wouldn't leave crisis will cause you to do things you wouldn't do crisis will cause you to, to, to go places that you wouldn't go all because your mind is altered not in its right state but in the state of crisis they're in this place where they, they just up and leave and they go to this place by the name of Moab. Well, while, while they're there, Elimelech, the daddy, he dies. So Malon and Chilion, one marries a woman by the name of Orpah and another marries a woman by the name of Ruth. Oh. Then ten years later, Malon and Chilion die. Yes, sir. Every single day, Naomi sits there and she looks at three graves on a hillside. Every single day of her life that she gets up, she looks out, she sees a dead husband and two dead sons. Right. That could have been avoided if she would have stayed where God told her to be. Right. Now, that's not, that's not what I came to preach today, but I'm free will Baptist. I might as well plow on it while I'm here because y'all ain't got nowhere else to go. Right? Uh, so I, I begin to find that, there, that every single morning she wakes up and she looks out, she sees three graves on a hillside. And every time she looks there, she says, man, I wonder if they'd still be alive if I hadn't went there. I wonder if in the middle of the crisis we could have just made our way through and not tried to quit. And I, I'm going to make this all applicable in a minute because it probably sounds like I'm speaking French to you right now. But just hold on one second. On. But every single morning she looks up and she says, man, there's three graves sitting up there. There's one for my son. There's one for my other son. There's one for my husband. And I wonder if they'd still be alive if I hadn't have moved. On. What does that have to do with you? I wonder if your kids would be, still be in church if you hadn't quit on them. Preach on I wonder if your marriage would still be together if you hadn't quit on it. Come on. But the crisis got the best of your mind. Right. And it caused you to do something you didn't do in your right mind. And now every single day you've got to look at three graves on a hillside. Go ahead, brother. That was all free. That ain't what I came to preach. Go ahead. You begin to go on and find that that 
Malon and Chilion dying. So now Naomi, she's sitting here in Moab. She said, man, there ain't nothing else here for me. All my family's dead. And everybody's gone. Why would I even stay here? And so she makes up her mind. She says, I'm going back to Bethlehem. I'm going back to my home. And then Orpah and Naomi and Orpah and Ruth, they come up to her. They said, listen, we, we're going with you. Like, our life is accustomed to you right now. She, she looks at him. She says, I'm too old to give you two more sons. There ain't no point in you going. All right, come on. One daughter did one thing. Right. And the other did the other. Right. One looked at her, kissed her goodbye, mm -hmm. and went back to the world. Because she didn't think that anything of the things of God had anything to offer her. <laughs> Come on now. And the other said, your people will be my people. Right. Yes, sir. Your God will be my God. Right. Your land will be my land. Yes, sir. One kissed her goodbye, and one clung for dear life. That's good. Good preaching. What kind of Christian are you today? Come on. Do you think that this church thing has nothing to offer you? Think about it. So you kiss God goodbye? Come on. Because you don't think God has anything else he can produce for you? Come on, preacher. You don't think God has any more spiritual sons and blessings he can give you so you kissed him goodbye and went back to the world? Come on. Or did you say, I'm not in this for what you can give me, but what you've already gave to me? Good preacher. Good preaching, preacher. I hope by the end of what I got done, get done saying with what I got to say today, you'll categorize yourself in one particular group. But if not, you can change that. Ahead. You'll begin to find, I look here, and if you're taking notes this morning, write it down. The first thing I find is the problems of kissing. The problems of kissing. You begin to find that she's sitting here and Orpah would go back to, now I'm going to get graphic for a minute to explain the scripture. Uh, but Orpah would go back to Moab and, and she'd go back to the place of this world. You won't find this in the Bible. You will find this when you begin to study out the Jewish laws and customs and the teaching of that day. But Orpah would go back to Moab and she would sleep with a hundred men and one dog in one night. Now if that ain't crazy, I don't know what is. She had everything she wanted in Bethlehem, but she didn't think there was anything to offer. Come on. And so she goes back to the world, and she sleeps with a hundred men and one dog in one night. Not over a period of, in one night. <coughs> and that produces something that we still struggle with. Because out of that encounter, she gave birth to five giants. Come on. Come on. One of them, you know by the name of Goliath. Right. So there's a few things I begin to look at the giants that she gave birth to. And some things about these giants and what their names mean. And I realize that every single one of us face every last one of these giants. You've heard of Goliath before. Goliath is uh, the giant of fear. And when you look up the name Goliath in the Hebrew, the reason he is the giant of fear is because his name means exile. So what does that have to do with anything? That giant will cause you to exile your faith and be trapped by fear. See, a lot of you have been there a lot more than you'd like to admit is where you completely exiled your faith and you were bound and chained by fear. Go ahead. You couldn't even go where you wanted to go because fear was confining you. Come on. You couldn't do what you wanted to do. You couldn't even go around people that you love because you were scared they were going to hurt you. Go ahead, preacher. And we all make the mistake a lot of times of when we're in fear of being hurt, we'll, people that we need in our life, we'll shut them out. Right. Because we're scared of getting hurt again. And there's nothing, well, I won't say there's nothing wrong with that, but you can't help how your heart hurts. Come on. And it'll cause you, fear will cause you to do some crazy things. It'll cause you to bleed out on people who never even cut you. Go ahead. Fear will cause you to, 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 to drop people that you need the most and run to people that you don't need. Go ahead, preacher. Or, the worst alternative, 
Fear will cause you to completely isolate yourself because as long as you're alone, nobody can hurt you. That's good. Thank you. Go ahead. As long as I don't have anybody in my circle, there ain't nobody that can turn their back on me. Go ahead. Because let's just be real about it. We all been hurt by people. Yes, sir. Let's just even, uh, we might as well just get real while we're in here this ahead, morning. Brother. We've all been hurt by church people. Come on. You want me to tell you why that hurts worse than any? Because it's the one you never saw coming. That's right. Because we're supposed to be a, 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 a loving and the most loving and nice and, and, and wonderful people on the face of this earth. And I found that church people will be some of the meanest little devils you'll ever meet in your entire life. You're right. Yeah, I said that. Y'all, y'all yeah. might get mad. Preach on. But my truck is like right there, and I can run very, very fast. Come on. There are a lot of church people who in here will hug your neck, and out there they're already talking about you. Yeah, yeah. And we wonder why nobody wants to come. We wonder why sinners aren't coming in every single week because we got a stereotype of, oh, they're church people. Go ahead. All they're going to do is drop me and hurt me and talk about me. Right. Anytime, any and every time I invite somebody that's lost to church, do you know what they say to me? What kind of people go to that church? Come on. Are they going to let me wear what I want to wear? Are they going to let me wear a hat? Are they going to let me do all that? And, and they'll start asking all these questions and doing all this stuff. Anytime I invite a sinner... That's one response. You know what the other response is? Nah, I don't really like to associate with them people. They're all mean. Go ahead. That's right. I don't know about you, but there's a problem there. That a lost and dying world outside won't walk through the threshold of our doors because they're scared of how we're going to treat them. Go ahead. Go ahead. I guess we forgot what Jesus was when he was in the Bible, but if I remember... And I may not, I mean, but if I remember right, I thought that it said he was a friend of sinners, not a shunner of them. Go ahead. Right. Shunner ain't a word, but it sounded real good it right is. then. <laughs> he sat at the same table, you know what, with the people that the church wouldn't have nothing to do with. You're right. The people that the church said, you ain't welcome in our synagogue, you ain't welcome in our worship services. You know what he did? He rolled up his sleeves and sat down in the dirt with them. Yes, sir. Because he's a God that works in the dirt. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's a God that'll get down in your filth and your and, and your and your shame and your sin and every single thing that you've done. That's he true. will pull it apart and get right down to where you are because yes, he sir. don't care about what people say you are. Come on. Because what does the Bible say? It says, "Man looks on the outward appearance, but God <laughs> looks at the heart." Yes, sir. Amen. See, normally when I come in here, I'm walking pews and stepping on y'all's foreheads, but I, I ain't doing that today. I'm just I'm talking to you because I got a burden for you. We begin to go on and begin to find that there's a giant by the name of Goliath. <coughs> then there's a giant by the name of Ishbabanab. He's the giant of bondage. Because when you look up Ishbabanab in the Greek, his name literally means to be taken captive. The Bible uh, talks in, I believe it's 2 Samuel chapter number 21, it says, and Ishbabanab was girded with a new sword. You know what that tells me? Every single day of my life, the devil comes up with a new way to bind me. Go ahead. That's good preaching. <laughs> I'll never understand how we continually fall for the exact same tricks of Satan because they ain't never changed. Good preaching. And can I tell you something? Every single trick that the devil brings against you, Jesus already overcame them. How can I say that? Yeah. Because there's only three that he can come up with. Every single temptation you fall into, every single sin you fall into, uh, 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 cuss words, fornication, uh, uh, drug, alcohol, every single bit of it falls into one of three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, right. and the pride of life. Yes. It's one of those three. Lust of the flesh is what pleases you. This... Uh, Absolutely dumb theory that's out in the world today. If it feels good, just do it. Come on. Preach on, brother. 
Well, if it feels good, it'll give you a real good feeling. It'll also send you to a real devil's hell. Yes, sir. Preach on. That's not what we like to talk about anymore, but I, I care more about your soul than you being happy with me. Right. You're on target. We begin to find that there's this society that says, if it feels good, you only live once. You're right. Which means you only got one chance to make him your Lord and Savior. Amen. You only got one lifetime to do it. Because can I tell you, this is a hard reality to face. But the moment that you close your eyes and breathe your last breath, there ain't no do-overs. There ain't no second chances. Because the moment that you breathe your last breath and you close your eyes and they roll you down the middle of a church aisle in a coffin, There ain't no going to the altar again. Come on. Right, preacher. And you'll be at an altar. Uh -huh. But it won't be crying out for God's mercy. Come on. I'd sure like to know before I drew my last breath that I was clinging to God and not kissing him goodbye. Amen. Amen. Can I tell you something? The thing... Uh, that a lot of people don't realize about this whole Christian life is they think when they get into it, there's not going to be any trouble. There's not going to be any trials. Go ahead. But the thing you don't realize is the moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the devil is going to fight you more than he did when you were in the world because now he has a reason to. Right, right. Preaching. And the moment that you get saved, there is a crosshair that goes on your soul and a bullseye that's dead in the middle of it. And the devil will do any and everything he can to stop you. A lot of you are Christians and wonder why you're facing the stuff you're facing. If you're facing a lot of trials, you're probably one of the best Christians around. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know why? Because the devil only fights what he fears. Yes, sir. If he ain't got nothing to be scared of you about, he ain't going to fight you. Right. Why would a burglar rob an empty house? Why would the devil waste his time on empty Christians when he's got dedicated ones? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on. If you constantly struggle with anxiety and depression and fear, you're probably doing something right. Go ahead. If you constantly are living for God and wonder why the harder you live for God, the harder the devil fights you, keep doing what you're doing because you're doing something right. Amen. But if you get to that place where life is good, ain't a care in the world. You're living on Rainbow Mountain eating Skittles and playing with unicorns? Go ahead. You might want to check yourself, honey. Preach it. Preach it. Because he ain't got no reason to fight you no more. Right. I begin to find there's a giant by the name of Goliath, and there's a giant by the name of Ishbabanab, and then there's a giant by the name of Seth. Now, this is the one that threw me off a little bit. I had to do a little bit of digging for this giant. When I looked up his name in the Hebrew, it meant moss. Yeah, like the green stuff that grows on houses, moss. We thinking of the same, yeah, that thought y'all just had is the same thought I had. And I was like, God, what in the world am I going to tell him when this man's name means moss? Go ahead. I'm sitting there looking at all these giants, and I'm getting excited. I'm jumping up on my desk right about now saying, yeah, I got something to say. And then I said, it means mo moss. Go ahead. Mm, Jesus, what in the world am I going to say? And then I started looking up moss. You know what moss does? It soaks up moisture and turns into mold. You know what mold does? It destroys stuff. So how does that have anything to do with me? What does a sap giant do? He'll take your ears and let you start soaking in stuff. That eventually is going to destroy you. That sap giant likes to come at 3 o'clock in the morning when you feel like you ain't got nobody, and he starts telling you you don't have anybody. Go ahead. Just get really real about it. That sap giant, that giant who starts telling you that you're completely alone, <laughs> and he knows the devil can't kill you, so he convinces you to do it yourself. Go ahead. The devil knows he can't kill you. 
Welcome to the spirit of suicide. He knows, you can, he, he, he knows he physically has no power to kill you, so what does he do? He convinces you that you should just do it yourself. You start soaking in all this moisture. The moisture's turned into mold. You know what the mold's going to do? It's going to absolutely 110% kill you. But it seems innocent when it's just a little bit of rain. Moss does not hurt a thing. Moss, when it's soaked in by moisture, produces mold that will kill you. Yes. And a lot of you have soaked in thoughts about yourself Moss. that have ruined your self-image, Moss. and they're not even true. You've convinced yourself that nobody wants anything to do with you, because a lot of people have dropped you, and now you convince yourself you're just going to be alone forever. Mom. You convince yourself that I, there just must be something wrong with me. Could it be possible that God ain't found anybody fit enough to be your friend? That's good. Could it be because the people you keep rolling with in your circle are pulling you farther away from the cross than closer to it? And he says, you know what? I'm preparing people who's going to make you better, not kill your walk with me. Go ahead. And so we get these images in our mind like we're this awful person and really all we are is on the potter's wheel being molded and made into what he has us to do. Go ahead. The sap giant is probably the giant I've struggled with more than any other giant in my entire life. Yes, yes, sir. I can honestly look at you and tell you, God hears me. I've never done a drug never touched an alcohol bottle. Not one time. Can I tell you something though? If you have, that don't make you any worse than me. Go ahead. That's right. That's right. Because can I tell you the lies that I've told is just as bad as that alcohol bottle you turned up? You're right, preacher. I mean, let's just be real. Let's get past our church, uh, our churchy self-righteous selves and realize ain't none of us deserve anything that God has for us. Go ahead. And at the end of the day, you give every, God every single thing that you got, and it still equals filthy rags. Right. A lot of us have a real hard time understanding that. You're we on. think that we can just stick our nose up at people because we've sat on a pew for 10 years. Well, there's a lot of people that sit on a pew for 10 years that's going to sit in a real hell one day. You're right. You know why? Because they act like they're better than everybody else, and they don't want anything to do with church folk. Yes, sir. They don't want anything to do with the world. Can I tell you, the church is not the four-wall building you're sitting in. Right. Right. This four-wall building with pretty stained glass and a pretty little setup up here, that ain't the church, honey. Go ahead. And if you think that that is going to be your ride to, to heaven, honey, <laughs> man, you need to talk after church because we need to get some things straight. Go ahead, preacher. The church is inside of here. That's why sinners should still be getting Jesus whether they're walking in the doors of this church or not. Amen. Because you carry the church with you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I want to ask all of you a question. If you're the only Bible that somebody reads, this week, did they read something that make them want to do with Christianity or never touch it again? That's good, bro. That's good. Mm. That's a hard pill to swallow. Did you offer off something this week that would make somebody say, hey, that Jesus guy might actually be somebody worth trying? Or did you offer off something that says, ooh, that's how church people act. I don't ever want anything to do with it. Come on, preacher. That's good. What kind of Jesus are you showing off? Mm. But better yet, before you can show off Jesus, you've got to ask yourself, what are you doing with Jesus? Come on. Kissing them goodbye or clinging to them. Right. And then, the giant that shocked me the most, and I thought trying to figure out the one with the moth was bad. Then there was one that didn't even have a name. So you give me one that's got a name that means green fuzz, and then you give me one that don't even have a name. And I looked it up. I started trying to find, and I couldn't find nothing about this joker. 
He's mentioned one time in the Bible, and he ain't even got a name. Like, what in the world does that speak to a, to a Christian? And then I started feeling God say, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. It's you. See, the one thing you'll find about this giant, he ain't got a name. But he's got six fingers on his left hand and six toes on his right foot. You know what that tells me? He got an extra finger to slap me with and an extra toe to kick me with. Go ahead. And then I started thinking, what in the world? And then I realized there's two things that this giant offers. He don't have a name, so he doesn't even have an identity. So what's his job to steal yours? He's got an extra finger and extra toe, so what is he? He's the giant of deformity. He was deformed, so he'll deform you. So what does that, what does this giant do? First of all, he'll make you lose your identity in God by defining you by the identity of your past. Go ahead. And then he'll make that the way of life you live and deform your walk with God. He'll take everything that you thought you were supposed to be a part of. And just pull it right out from under you. And pull everything away from you. Good preaching, brother. And in the process, you'll lose your own identity. Because he made you think that the deformity was what you were defined by. Amen. You say, preacher, I don't think I've ever faced a giant like that in my life. Really? So you tell me the devil's never called you? By a drug addict, Come on. or an alcoholic, or a fornicator, Go ahead. or an adulteress, or a liar, or a thief, or a cheater, or a robber. You tell me the devil's never called you none of that, and he's never made you wonder about your past. You know what that was? That was that no-name giant. Good. He was robbing your identity. Amen. Because can I tell you something? I don't care what church people have told you. I don't care what the devil has told I don't care what anybody. You are not defined by the mistakes that you have made. Right. Nod your head with me. You are not defined by the mistakes that you make. Right. You are, are and only what God says that you are. Look at me. You are not defined by an alcohol bottle. You are not defined by a drug. You are not. I don't care if you've done every single one under the sun. If you've got the blood covering your heart, it don't matter what you've yeah, done. Because Go can I tell you, when you get to heaven one day, all God's going to do is look at your heart. He ain't going to say, how many drugs did you do? How many alcohol bottles did you You know what he's going to say? Did you accept my son Jesus? And if you say, yes, I did, it don't matter what you've done. All that matters is the identity that's on you. That's why it don't matter if you're black, red, yellow, whatever you are. Yes. We all got the same color heart, yes. and that's Jesus' red blood. Yes. That's why it's not a white man's gospel, it's not a black man's gospel, it's not a church kid gospel or a, 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 a drug slinging mama and daddy gospel. It's a whosoever will. Preach on. Something blew my mind the other day. I've been told my whole entire life God's fair. He ain't. Because right. if God was fair, every last one of us would be in hell. That's right. I've been told my whole entire life, he's a fair, he's a righteous God. He ain't fair, because don't none of us deserve him. Right. He's a just God, which means he'll judge you rightly. Yeah. Honey, he ain't fair. Because right. if he's fair, you wouldn't be in here today. That's right. Some of you'd be in jail. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you the reason some of us aren't in the way that other sinners are because we didn't get caught. Go ahead. You're right, preacher. Dead on, brother. God had more mercy on us than he did some people. But honey, he ain't fair. Because he's been way better to you than you'll ever deserve him being. Right. He's been way better to me than I'll ever deserve. Listen, I fail him all day, every day. But every single time, he forgives me right over again. Now tell me one other person in this world you'll meet that every single, if you messed up 
with them as many times as you messed up with God, how many that they would still forgive you as much as God does? Because well, right. Christians have a problem forgiving people. <laughs> right. It's kind of funny because the whole moral of our entire religion is forgiven, and we can't even forgive people for stuff from right. 30 years ago. Go ahead. Some of y'all, Lord Jesus, should I say it? I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Some of y'all come into church every single week and see somebody who hurts you back in high school and you won't even sit on the same pew as them. Go ahead. Because you're bitter. Uh-huh. Let's just be real about it. If you can't worship the people down here, don't go up there. Go ahead, preacher. Because them people that wronged you down here honestly probably don't even remember what they did to you. And you're hindering your walk with God over something that somebody did to you that they don't even realize they did. It's kind of funny when you think about it, because a lot of times church folk act like a bunch of kindergartners, Go ahead. like we're four. Honey, get over yourself. Now, that's a tough pill to swallow, but I mean, y'all can just look at me like I'm a deer in headlights, but it's true. I mean, like, a lot of us have a problem forgiving people. But just to think about it, what if... Jesus forgave you as much as you forgave other people. I wouldn't be. Yeah. What if we literally got up every single day and said, I'm going to live just like Jesus did? This world would be a lot better place. Sure would. But don't a whole lot of us do that. Right. A lot of us have the mindset and the mentality, I'm going to live like Jesus today. And then by like, we got up at 7, and by 8 o'clock, we done failed. Kind of like people make New Year's resolutions, and then by January the 2nd, they done failed. Like, because in human nature, we flaw, yes, sir. and we make mistakes. So now, we've got all that, so now I'll get you to the, the good part. Come on. We've got the problems with kissing, but then the power of cleaving. I'm almost done. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> The power of cleaving. You'll find that in Ruth chapter number 4, the Bible says, talks about Ruth. She went back to, uh, to uh, Bethlehem, and this guy by the name of Boaz saw her working in a field, and they fell in love, and they did all this. And then somewhere in Ruth chapter number 4, I think it's about verse number 21 and 22, it says, And Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Go ahead. Some of y'all missed that right there. Go ahead. You know what that has to do with you? One daughter went to the world and produced things that destroyed her. Right. The other daughter clung to God and produced things that gave her the power to overcome that which was going to try to destroy her. Right. Because what did David do? David killed the giant, but he also picked up how many stones? That's good. Come on. And how many giants were there? He didn't pick up one stone. He, he, he didn't pick up five of them because he didn't think the first one killed Goliath. He had four other brothers he was taking out that day, too. Right. So you ran to the world and you produced giants. You ran to God and you produced stones to kill your giants. So did you kiss or did you cleave? Good. Today, do you feel like you're facing giants and you don't have any weapons to fight them? You probably kiss God goodbye. Today, are you facing giants and you feel like you've got faith inside of you? Even if it's as small as a grain of a mustard seed, you've still got faith. Yes, sir then you probably clung to God for dear life. Now here's my question. This is where it's going to get tough to chew. And I want you to really think about this. Mama, Daddy, have you clung to God or kissed Him? Uh-huh. Let me just go ahead and tell you something. What you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. That's good, preacher. That's real good.
going to tell you something that I've realized to be true in my life. You need a pastor and a church more than you need a coach, more than you need academic excellence, more than you need talent, fame, or fortune. You need God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Parents, I'm going to talk to you for a minute right here. If your kids are forced to miss church because of a sporting event, there ain't nothing wrong with sports, but when sports become your God, there's a problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When they never get to go to church because you're forcing them to play a sport, you are hurting them more than you are helping them. Right. So let's just be real about it. I mean, like, there might be some random, you know, sporadic of talent in here today. There ain't none of y'all about to be in the NFL. And I know ain't none of y'all about to be in the NBA. <laughs> y'all from Shelby. Y'all from Kayser and Shelby. Y'all ain't going to the NBA, brother. I'm sorry. So what's it going to mean if you spent your whole entire life chasing something you're never going to achieve and you lost God in the process? Some of y'all going to go out here today and say, I said it was a sin to play a sport. That's not in any way, shape, or form what I said. I love sports. I play sports. But I also had to give up sports. Yeah. Because they started changing my identity. Amen. And they started becoming more important to me than church. Listen, I know you want the best for your kids. But look. You want them to have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life or on four degrees? Go ahead. Go ahead. Because can I tell you, you can have tw 24 doctorates of, of education, whatever you want to do, and when you hand them to God on Judgment Day, if it ain't in the Lamb's Book of Life, honey, it ain't going to go nowhere. Right. Can I tell you something? You're not taking your degrees to the grave with you. You're not taking your fame to the grave with you. Go ahead. But you can take your relationship with God. And unfortunately, you can also go to the grave without it. Right. Mama and Dad, are you kissing or are you cleaving? Yes, Look right here. Look right here. When you treat Jesus as optional, don't get mad when your kids treat him as unnecessary. When you treat Jesus in your house, their whole entire childhood, like he's an option. I was a drug baby. I was drugged to church when I didn't want to go. Like, there was some mornings, my mom's here this morning. And there was some mornings, yeah, y'all look at her, y'all pray for her, she's crazy. No, I'm kidding. No, but uh, there was some mornings. There was some mornings. She put me in a polo and khaki pants. I really didn't want to go, and I was about to just start swinging that thing a little bit. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to go to church. It's even worse when your papa's the pastor, because then you got to act right in church. <laughs> did, it, did that mean I did? <laughs> nope. But my whole entire life, yeah, my mom made a lot of mistakes. As I, I told you she's crazy. My parents made mistakes. They obviously did something right. Yes, they were flawed. They were imperfect. They made a lot of mistakes, and now I'm old enough to tell them they did. Whoop, because I can't get a spanking. But they made a lot. I won't go outside today. She's going to beat me with a baseball bat or something like that. No, but I made a lot of mistakes growing up. They made a lot of mistakes. But I'm in church faithfully today. Why? Because in spite of all the mistakes they made, they made sure that God was the foremost front and foundation in my life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Look at me. Look at me real clear. Some of you parents have tried and tried and tried and tried to instill Jesus in your children, and you feel like they're a million miles from God. Look at me. When you plant a seed, that seed will grow. Because one day they're going to hit a crisis in their life, 
and they're going to fall flat down on their face, and life is going to fall apart. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to remember that Jesus that Mama and Daddy told them about. They might be running from him now, but I promise you, you give it one day, and that whole entire world that they've built their life on, that shaky foundation that they've built their life on, is going to completely fall apart when the storm comes and the sand blows away. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, maybe I'll give that Jesus that they raised me on a try. But I'm going to also say something that a lot of parents have not grasped. Do not force Jesus down your child's throat. I'm going to repeat that. Do not force Jesus down your kid's throat. Because do you know what that causes people to do? That causes them to look at Jesus as a requirement and not a blessing. Show them the way to church. Show them the things of Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. And then you know what? One day, they'll choose him on their own. Amen. And they don't need to choose him because you shoved him in their face. That's hard for us to swallow. But I know a lot more people than you would think that were shoved. Jesus, Jesus. They, they were told they couldn't make mistakes and Jesus would shove down their throat like a plate of food. Can I tell you something? When I was little, my grandma would hold my mouth open and put peas in my mouth. Them little green, nasty peas. She would hold my mouth open like my papa would like hold me open like I was at the dentist office. And she'd say, I made these. You're going to eat them. And just start pouring them down my face. Now at 18 years old, when I can make my own choices, I will never touch a pea again. <laughs> Why? Because I remember when she'd get a curtain rod and threaten to beat my brains out because I didn't eat a pea. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Now peas are the most disgusting thing I've ever looked at. Because I didn't have a choice in it. I'm, I'm going to say this, because y'all know where I stand politically. I'm just going to say it real, real quick. And just, that's why 95% of Americans don't like wearing masks, because they were shoved on. Right. A lot of us would be more apt to wear them if we had a choice, yes. but they were shoved on. I'm just trying to make this practical to you. Yeah. A lot of you wouldn't have a problem wearing a mask if the government didn't shove it in you and right. shove it in your face. You wouldn't mind doing it, but human nature hates something that is forced on you. And can I tell you something? If you force Jesus on people, they will feel about Jesus the same way that I do here in the city. It was shoved in my face when I didn't want it, and now I'll never touch it again. Train up a child the way that it should go. It doesn't say beat a child because they didn't go to church today. Train up a child the way that it should go. And you know what the promise of God is? It shall not depart from it all the days of its life. Parents, if you're giving your kid Jesus and they don't want nothing to do with it, keep giving him. But can I tell you something? Your lost kids do not need to be told they're dirty again. Right. They don't need to be told they're nasty again or that they're going to hell over and over and over every single day. Eventually, you need to start telling them that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Amen. I'm done. Somebody say amen right there. I'm done. But look right here. Are you kissing or are you cleaving? Teenager. You think that this Christian life, and all that it has to offer, ain't enough for you? And so you're kissing him goodbye? Or you're clinging to him for dear life? See, I wish that every single church I went to, I could make this kind of choice for people. Because there would be a whole lot more people saved. Amen. But I can't. You can make it for yourself. Do you find yourself producing giants or producing stones? 
Are you kissing? Or are you sleeping? As everybody stands in this place today, I don't know who you are or where you are or what's going on in your life. But I do know that there is a God that loves you and is there for you. And he's never one time ever failed you. And I'll make a bargain with, with you that I make a lot of people at churches that I go to. Here's my bargain. If Jesus ever fails you, I'll let you quit on him and I won't ask you not to. Would you make a bargain with me? That if he doesn't fail you, you hold his hand all the days of your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around today. I promise you I'm the only one looking around. I wouldn't embarrass you for anything in this world. But can I see your hand maybe if you'd say, Preacher, today, if I was to drive out, Preacher, I know you're the only one looking at me and nobody's looking around. But if I was to go out of this place today and I'd slip off into eternity, I don't know that I would 100% go to heaven. Can I see your hand? Thank you for that honest hand. Anybody else today? Is there anybody else in here today that would say, Preacher, I, I, I want to do right, I long to do right, but I just can't figure out how to be right. Can I see that hand? Thank you. Now, is there anybody in here today that would say, Preacher, I want to cling to God, but life's just hard right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody that say, Preacher, I have a desire to really live for God, but the struggle is very difficult right now. Can I see that hand? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody look at me. I saw your hands and God saw your hands. I promise you, Jesus is the best decision you'll ever make. Everything that life has ever brought me, through the storms that it has brought me, the trouble it has brought me, I can never one time say that I've complained about you. Listen, if you're waiting on problems to end out, it's not going to happen. If you're not facing problems right now, pack a lunch. Jesus on you, raised you up, or they never, you didn't never even heard Jesus when you got out of your house. It never matters. I've also got something that every single church that I've preached at, no matter the denomination or how many people were in the room, somebody's still in church today. Somebody's lost. And somebody. you to 
today? Is there anybody raised their hand? sick and he died later on. The son said that he didn't want to live in that mansion that was left to him because he was sick. He didn't want to serve his dad anymore. They didn't know y'all ever heard that state on you. He was selfish. When they got out there, they took that picture of that man's son down. Put everything in that house and they set it up. That auctioneer got up there. He said, we're going to start the is, he said, I don't know nothing. He said, but there's a church up on the hill, and at night, that cross out front lit up. If you can get me to that cross, I can find the rest of you. Can I tell you, you might not have nothing, but if you've got Jesus, you've got everything you ever need. You might not have nobody, but you've got Jesus. I just wanted to keep doing what my friends used to do. I didn't, I didn't want to not be popular at school. I didn't get to live a lot as a teenager. Now I'm an adult, and I, my parents were so hard on me. Now I'm free, and I just like, I don't want to go to hell. I, I was just trying to live.
know who you are to raise your hand this morning. Is there anybody that would make a public declaration of faith and say, I don't want to go to hell and go to hell? I'd like to ask that soul if you'd be willing. I wouldn't call you out for anything in this world, but I'll make you a deal. If you'll come to this altar, I'll meet you there. Is there anybody that'd like to come and change their heart and their life today? I promise you, if you make the first step, He'll make the next. Here comes one. Here comes two. Once you step out of that pew, you've already
making no bones about it. We all have fought giants. We all see them. They're as real as real gets. Some of us have faced a giant of loss, a giant of COVID, a giant of fear. But for every giant that's ever stood up, God's always got the rock to sink it right in the forehead. If it stands before God, it will fall flat of its face. Whether it be a man or a stone or an idol, even you, one day, every knee's going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that He is the Lord. Today would be a good day to confess it because you can confess it now or you can confess it later. One day you will. Reminded of when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it inside the room where Dagon was. And the Bible said that Dagon was a stone. And when they went in there, they heard a ruckus. They went in there and Dagon was flat of his face before the Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark of the Covenant? That's the presence of God. And if a stone knows when to bow down, an idol, shouldn't we as children of God? Great is his faithfulness. I've not been faithful to him all my life. Boy, he's never not been faithful to me. Appreciate the Lord. Appreciate you. I'll tell you this. You may not come to this altar. There's an altar that you can go to. I pray before you cross the threshold of those doors, if you didn't come to this altar and you raised your hand or you're lost, you're undone, you're backslidden, cold and indifferent on God, that you don't leave here that way. You don't have to. We'll pray with you and pray for you. We're in no hurry. El Acapulco serves all day last time I checked. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. They keep the light on for you. Amen. I've talked to several of them fellas. I said, look, if you see us stumbling in at around 10 o'clock, would you still serve us? And that fellow said, preacher, you come in here with anybody, we'll serve you. I said, well, good, because we might stumble in a little late from time to time. He said, no problem. Old Jimmy, he's a good one. We appreciate the Lord, appreciate you being here. Uh, if you'll take a seat just for a moment, I need to put the church into business. Now, if you're not a member of this church, don't run off. You can stay. Amen. We just got to do a little business real quick. Um, amen. I appreciate Brother Noah and what he preached this morning. I know many times we think of.